to give you an overview of our teaching strategy at Edge Plus and how do we support you um, uh, and how do we support you uh, in your journey and um, and how do we support you uh, grasp the contact and the content uh, of what's required of you and uh, prepare you for the exam. I will share with you uh, two examples. I will share with you two cases and uh, share with you our uh, teaching strategy. So let me share the screen with you. Now, I think uh, all of you can see my screen. So the first uh, case, which I want to share with you, is an obstetrics case. So the way we teach first, it's uh, uh, all our cases are MCQ, multiple choice question, and CDM, clinical decision-making based. And we depend in our teaching strategy on uh, what's known as analysis of knowledge driven, meaning that you check the case, you read the case, the multiple choice question, you read it very well. It's a long case, okay? So you have to, uh, we train you on how to pick up the keywords from this long case and summarize and concise this long multiple choice question into two sentences with the important keywords to make a brief story of the whole uh, multiple choice question so that you can wrap it up and finish it up quickly. Uh, analyze the knowledge given to you. Uh, and based on that, when you analyze it, you link it to your knowledge base. And at this point, when you analyze and link the knowledge given to you in the multiple choice question, with your knowledge base, which you um, uh, learn from Toronto Notes, by linking both together, at, only at the end, you'll be able to pick up the answer choice quickly. And by quickly, I mean that we're helping you and preparing you to answer the multiple choice question in less than one minute. We help you recognize and analyze the keywords and link the analyzed keywords to the answer choices. The same also applies for the CDM, uh, our expectation is that you should answer it in less than three minutes. We help you recognize and analyze the keywords and link the analyzed keywords to the answer choices. So our first case is about infections during pregnancy. A 33 years old female who's gravid a one para zero, uh, 27 weeks gestation. Uh, she came to you, uh, so, so as you can see there are the keywords are highlighted here in yellow, okay? So the risk factors for this case, the age, 33 years old, because as you know, different diseases or diseases go as per age groups, okay? The gender, some diseases are gender-based, okay? Uh, then uh, because this is a case of obstetrics, so we have to mention like uh, the gravida and the para, the GTP, uh, AL, the gravida, the gravida full term, the gravida para, uh, full term uh, uh, abortions, and number of living children. So this case was gravida one para zero, and in this pregnancy she was 27 weeks gestation. She came to your office for a prenatal visit. She recently immigrated to Canada from Italy where she had an ultrasound at eight weeks gestation to confirm pregnancy. A few weeks ago, she had fever. So fever during pregnancy, this of course must highlight or this must spark you to think of an infection during pregnancy, okay? Fever, diffuse non-periodic, two-day maculopapular rash. So fever with rash during pregnancy, again, this must uh, grasp your attention that this patient had an infection during pregnancy, uh, which results spontaneously without intervention, no significant past medical history, vital signs are normal, fundal height is 23 and she's 27 weeks gestation. So there is a discrepancy between the fundal height and the, uh, the gestational age. Fetal heart rate is 160 beat per minute, a transabdominal ultrasound showed bilateral ventriculomegaly and multiple intracranial basal ganglia calcifications. 
So whenever you see an ultrasound showing, showing such uh, abnormal features as the bilateral ventricular megaly and the multiple intracranial basal ganglia calcifications, again, you must suspect that this patient had a serious infection during pregnancy. The transabdominal ultrasound showed ascites, hepatomegaly, and the estimated fetal weight below the fifth percentile for gestational age. So these are the keywords summarized for you. So the differentials that you may think of on your way to you or uh, before heading to the question, think of the differentials. So infections during pregnancy might be toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex, parvovirus B19, uh, varicella zuster, uh, and chlamydia trachomatis. So these are the most important infections that may happen to a pregnant woman. So here is the question that you have to answer, which of the following is the most likely pathogen causing this, this fetal infection? Is it herpes simplex, chlamydia, toxoplasma, varicella zuster, or parvovirus B19? So if quickly, uh, like it can be any one of them. So how do we differentiate between all of them? Or how do we differentiate herpes from chlamydia, from toxoplasma, from varicella, from parvovirus? Of course, there are distinctive clinical features for each one of them. So this is where I told you, you have to link the, the analyzed question, which we already did, which we already did with the knowledge base, with your knowledge base, which you got it from Toronto notes. So the correct answer is Toxoplasma gondii. So why is it Toxoplasmosis? Simply because first of all, it's an infection, fetal infection during pregnancy, maternal fever, non-periodic maculopapular rash, then you have the ultrasound features of a fetal bilateral ventricular megaly, basal ganglia calcifications, growth restriction, discrepancy between the fundal height and the gestational age. So this is most likely congenital toxoplasmosis because of the distinctive clinical features, the ventricular megaly and the basal ganglia calcifications. For the other infections and how do you differentiate? So chlamydia, this uh, the transmission usually occurs during delivery, uh, clinical features, neonatal conjunctivitis, neonatal pneumonia, uh, congenital rubella. So this presents with a maternal periuretic, not non-periuretic, but this time it's a periuretic maculopapular rash. So there is itching. In addition, there is the fetal intrauterine growth retardation. There is atrial septal defect and there is cardiomegaly. Varicella zuster, so this is maternal chick, chicken pox. So there is a periuretic vesicular rash, vesicular rash, and there is the fetal limp aplasia and hydropus fetalis, congenital herpes simplex. So this is a maternal painful uh, genital ulcers, and in addition to fetal placental umbilical cord and temporal loop calcifications. Finally, congenital uh, cytomegalovirus, which presents with uh, fetal ascites, fetal hepatomegaly, fetal periventricular calcifications and the hyperechogenic bowel. So these are the distinctive clinical features for congenital cytomegalovirus and what we, you will see by ultrasound if you did an ultrasound to the mom. Uh, and the congenital parvovirus B19, as you know, the patient presents with uh, the, the, the fetus, will present with fetal anemia and the hydropus fetalis. Uh, so this is the first case which I wanted to share with you, which uh, gives you an idea of our uh, teaching strategy. The next case is uh, uh, a case of psychiatry. So um, um, uh, this case presents a 74 years old man who comes to the office for a scheduled follow-up after hospitalization for recent MI, which happened or which occurred four weeks ago. The patient had has had no cardiac symptoms and has adhered to the outpatient medication regimen. When asked how he has been, he says, I just don't feel like my old self. The patient's usual routine has been disrupted since he was discharged. So take care of the keywords. So the previous case, I showed you the keywords. This case, like it's a practice for you, try to pick up, train your eyes to pick up the keywords. So this case, I'm not going to show the keywords for you. You have to train your eyes on picking up the keywords as we go through it. I just don't feel like my old self. The patient's usual routine has been disrupted since he was discharged. He's not meeting with his friends and has not been able to read the newspaper all the way through. He naps on his couch during the day and wakes up earlier than he wants in the morning. The patient's medical history includes diet control, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, obesity, 
Medications include aspirin, metoprolol, atorvastatin, lisinopril, sublingual nitroglycerin. Vital signs are within normal. Physical examination is unremarkable except for moderate, moderate obesity. So as we go through the case quickly, now I'm going to tell you the keywords. So hopefully you have picked up the keywords by yourself. So again, the age, 74 years, 70 years, 70, 74 years old. The gender, male, male or a man. Uh, the uh, uh, place, the healthcare setting where the case is being presented in the office, okay, and what's the reason for the visit. So it is a follow-up visit uh, after hospitalization for recent MI, which was four years ago. Now, the actual reason, so take care, this is like a trick because the actual reason for the visit is not that. The actual reason is I just don't feel like my old self. This is the actual reason for the visit. I just don't feel like my old self. Whenever a STEM say uh, mentions this whenever the stem mentions or whenever the mcq case mentions a statement like this always think of a psychiatric illness psychiatric disease i just don't feel like my old self now let's dig uh, further the routine has been disrupted so there is um uh, this so disrupted routine means that the patient is not functioning well uh, not meeting with the friends. Now take care. Not meeting with the friends. Uh, hasn't been able to read the newspaper. Naps on the couch. So disturbed uh, sleep-wake cycle rhythm. Uh, uh, not socializing with the friends. Uh, napping on the couch all day. Wakes up earlier than he wants in the morning. So disturbed sleep-wake cycle rhythm. In an old age, after a recent MI. So at this point, think of uh, depression. Okay, now diet control diabetes, hypertension, obesity, medications, aspirin, metoprolol, atrovastatin, lisinopril, sublingual, nitroglycerin. So keep them in the back of your mind because you're going to need these points when you answer the question. So here is the question. The patient reports low mood, appears slowed. So there is a psychomotor retardation and subdued. He declines psychotherapy. Which one of the following is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy. So this is the question you need to prescribe an antidepressant for him. So which antidepressant is suitable? Is it citalopram, dizipramine, mirtazapine, phenylazine, sertraline, trazodone, venlafaxine? And the correct answer is E, sertraline. Now why sertraline? As you know, there are different classes of antidepressants. There is the SR SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, noradrenergic and specific serotonin antagonists, uh, NASSA, uh, SARI, serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitor, MAOI, monomyoxidase inhibitors, and SNRI, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So this is a case of a major depressive episode. As you know, we uh, define it by the MCG, uh, MCG caps. Uh, where the M stands for the mood, depressed mood, uh, or loss of interest, uh, or pleasure, in addition to four or more of the following, lasting for more than or two or more than uh, two weeks, two weeks or more than two weeks, change in appetite or weight, sleep disturbance, psychomotor retardation or agitation, uh, re uh, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide, low energy, poor concentration, inappropriate guilt, thought of worthlessness, low self esteem, feeling of hopelessness. And no history of mania or hypomania, impaired functioning, not due to substance abuse or another medical condition. Now for the medications, and these are the uh, typical antidepressants, and uh, what are the side effects and the contraindications. So citalopram is an SSRI, SSRI is a side effect, uh, uh, dose-dependent QT prolongation, and it's contraindicated in the recent MI. Dizipramine, it's a tricyclic antidepressant, inhibits fast sodium channels and slows the cardiac conduction and contraindicated in cardiovascular diseases. Mertazapine, it's an NASSA, a side effect sedation weight gain and the contraindications cardiovascular disease. Phenylazine, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, side effects sedation weight gain drug and food interactions, serotonin syndrome, tyramine hypertensive crisis, and it's not a first line antidepressant, sertraline uh, SSRI, uh, safest SSRI, SSRI in pregnancy, uh, breastfeeding, and post MI. So that's why sertraline is the suitable answer. Uh, contraindications contraindicated to be used with monoamine oxidase inhibitors, trazodone, SSARI, 
side effects, sedation, orthostatic hypotension, contraindicated in the elderly, venla vaccine, SNRI, uh, side effects, tachycardia, increased blood pressure, and contraindications are recent myocardial infarction. And by this, uh, and by this uh, I have shared with you our teaching strategy at H+. So hopefully you had a glimpse of what we do at H+, how we walk you through the different uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.